you all uh, for being here on this rainy Saturday morning, President's Day weekend. You could be skiing. The snow is supposed to be great tomorrow. On the other hand, the crowds on President's Day weekend are awful, right? I once went and spent most of my time standing in line. So better to come and hear a cool talk on black holes, right? I mean, right black, yeah. black holes are like the coolest things. Anyway, uh, the Science at Cal lecture series grew out of the International Year of Astronomy 2009 lecture series that was initiated by our astronomy department. And it was so wildly successful that the students and postdocs who put it on decided to expand it indefinitely and also to cover other areas of science. So especially for you newcomers, you can get this kind of stuff every month. And uh, my colleague Rich Muller will surely give a very interesting talk next month. I'm not sure if one can ever get a completely nonpartisan <laughs> talk on, on global climate change. But uh, anyways, he's a very, very smart guy and has done some very interesting research in this area. And I think if anyone can give you a nonpartisan view, he's probably the person. OK, so my discussion this morning will be about black holes in space, what I call hearts of darkness uh, after Joseph Conrad's book. So basically, um, oops, oh, there we go. A black hole is a pretty simple thing, conceptually, and I'll repeat this a couple of times. It's just a region of space where matter has been compressed to such a small volume that the local gravity, the local gravitational field, is so strong that nothing can escape. Not apples, not rockets, not even light. No matter how fast you throw something, it, it can't escape. And so no light is reflected, no light is transmitted, no light is emitted. The thing looks completely black. So in fact, here's my prize-winning photograph of a black hole. Um, I normally sell this for $10,000, but you, special audience, just 5K, OK? Or if you want to create one of these things yourself, you can just you know, keep the lens cover of your uh, camera on. Or if you're using PowerPoint or Keynote, just choose a black background. Oh no, I've just revealed a trade secret. Anyway, um, you can't get out. Once you're in, so abandon all hope, ye who enter here. Those of you who've uh, read you know, Dante's Inferno, of course, uh, know this reference. Pop culture sees black holes being referenced all the time. Uh, here's, of course, some examples from science fiction. There's the old 1979 Disney movie, The Black Hole, a journey that begins where everything ends. Oh, my goodness. And then there's one on the right there, Event Horizon. Well, the Event Horizon is the boundary of a black hole, the, the point of no return, so to speak. Infinite space, infinite terror. From what I can tell, that movie actually had very little to do with black holes. But by giving it a title related to black holes, the producers would you know, kind of suck you in and uh, get you to, to view this movie. There's the Charles Burns graphic novel, Black Hole, which uh, again, has very little to do with black holes. It's actually about some kids in Seattle, I think, that uh, get some horrible disease and turn into zombies or something. But anyway, again, black hole, it kind of draws you in. So they've appeared in science fiction quite a lot. There's a few more seats here for those who are wandering in late. They even appear on greeting cards. Another black hole starts to form, and wouldn't you know it, right in Sid's room. Well, as I hope to show you today, black holes don't just form for no good reason anywhere. Um, there are only special circumstances in astrophysics where black holes can form. And I can assure you, they won't form in Sid's room, and they won't form in your room either, OK? Well, where might you find black holes in nature? Here locally, we have an excellent place to look for black holes. The Oakland Raiders have this <laughs> black hole zone, OK? Which is uh, an area where I think the fans are so rabid that any you know innocent passerby <laughs> would get sucked in, never to be released again from the clutches of this black hole zone. I mean, they're they're truly rabid, but this is what they call themselves, the, the black hole. Uh, <laughs> kind of funny, actually. Anyway, uh, you know, black holes are pretty crazy places. They, they drag, they suck you in, and they hold on fiercely. In, um, in astronomical circles, we like to say, what happens in a black hole stays in a black hole. OK. <laughs> All right, well, in fact, 
uh, light bulbs are pretty important. Former President Bill Clinton said in his January 21st, 2000 uh, Science and Technology Policy Address, there are so many more questions yet to be answered. And so I wonder, are we alone in the universe? What causes gamma ray bursts? What's in those black holes anyway? Now, you know, if the President of the United States mentions black holes, then it must be a pretty important topic, you know, at the level of Social Security and health care and things like that. <laughs> Maybe not quite, but uh, anyway, they're a popular topic, at least among a subset of us in the world. Yeah, anyway. Okay, so again, getting back to the science, a black hole is a region where the local gravity is so strong that nothing, not even light, can escape. Now, you can get the basic idea of a black hole going all the way back to Newtonian physics, okay, in the <coughs> late 16th and uh, early 17th centuries. In fact, some of Newton's successors considered his law of gravity, which says that the gravitational force between two objects is directly proportional to the product of their masses and inversely proportional to the square of the distance between them. Well, two people, John Mitchell and Pierre Simon de Laplace, uh, said, suppose you made gravity so strong that, you know, the escape speed, the speed at which you throw something, becomes the speed of light. It becomes so big that light can't escape that, in fact, maybe the most massive stars in the universe might be dark. And so here's the argument they essentially use. This will be the only math I really show you. Suppose you've got the Earth, M1, and this apple, M2. There's a certain speed with which I could throw it had I eaten my Wheaties this morning and if there were no ceiling here. And the apple would keep going instead of slowing down to a stop and reversing its motion. If I could throw it fast enough, about 7 miles per second, 11 kilometers per second, it would keep on going away from the Earth forever, okay? Always slowing down, but never coming back, okay, never coming to a halt if I throw it at a speed greater than the escape speed, all right? Now, suppose now I take the mass of the Earth and I squeeze it down to half of the current radius, and now I'm standing at the new compressed surface of the Earth. Well, the distance between the apple and the center of the Earth will be one half of what it used to be, so the square of that is one quarter. The force between the Earth and the apple then would be the reciprocal of one quarter or four times as great. And that doesn't mean that the escape velocity would be four times as great. The escape velocity actually goes as one over the square root of the radius of the Earth, so it would be um, you know, twice as high in this case. I'm sorry, uh, the square root of two is high in this case. But nevertheless, it would be a higher escape speed. Now, I could compress the Earth even more, let's say to, you know, one quarter of its original size, and then the force increases even more, and the escape velocity increases even more. And so you can use this plausibility argument that if I were to compress the mass of the Earth enough, in fact, it turns out to be about one centimeter radius, about the size of a walnut, then the escape speed, the speed with which I need to throw something to get it to actually always keep going away from the Earth, would reach the speed of light. And so Mitchell and Laplace argued that some stars might be dense enough, maybe not as small as the Earth in this case, but more massive and you know bigger, but nevertheless uh, dense enough to have a strong enough gravity such that the speed of light um, is insufficient, and so in that case, light wouldn't escape, all right? Now, that would mean that's a dark star, they, at that time, in the late, seven, uh, late 18th century, didn't know that no material objects can go faster than the speed of light. It turns out that's the case. They can't. But they at least said light you know, can't exceed the speed of light. And so such a dark star might not be visible, even though possibly apples might escape from it, because they didn't yet know that the speed of light is the absolute maximum. Well, so this plausibility argument was uh, applied, you know, over two centuries ago, a little over two centuries ago. Now, to do it right, okay, you need Einstein's general theory of relativity, okay? You can't just apply uh, Newton's law to light, for example, because light has no mass. This, this force formula doesn't even technically work for light. And in any case, this formula doesn't show you that apples can't escape. So to get it all right, you have to use Einstein's theory of relativity, which is... Uh, more enhanced, refined theory of gravity than what Newton had. Newton had the, the equation for gravity, but did, he didn't know what produces gravity. And what Einstein said was that what produces gravity is a curvature 
um, of space. This little monitor is turned. Oh, there it goes. Yeah, let me uh, turn on the lights here. Gravity is a curvature of space, so in fact, any object warps the shape of space, and indeed, it turns out, of time as well. I'll talk about that later in its vicinity. And you can make a two-dimensional example by taking a, a stretched piece of uh, fabric like this and just rolling a ping pong ball along it, and it goes in a straight line normally. But if I put a golf ball here, then Earth's gravity, of course, is pulling this down. This is where the analogy fails. In relativity, the golf ball itself would produce this curving around it. The Earth, the Sun, the black hole, they produce this curving around them. In what dimension? Well, sort of into a fourth spatial dimension, not the third dimension that I'm showing here, but sort of into a dimension into which I can't point. Nevertheless, space curves that way, and the, the upshot is, is that then, objects follow a curved path. You can see that, right? You, I start this thing off in what I thought was a straight line in my frame of reference, but it ends up forming what looks like a curve in my frame of reference. Now, it's actually a straight line, the shortest distance between two points in this curved space, but it looks like a curved path to us, and that effectively is what an orbit is. The Earth is going around the sun because it's following its natural straight line path in the space that has been warped by the sun's presence. That's what gravity is. See, Newton had no mechanism for gravity. He only had a formula relating the gravitational force between two objects, but he himself admitted he has no idea how gravity actually works. Einstein said, well, maybe gravity is a curvature of space and time. And in fact, um, in the case of, uh, of a black hole, this thing has grown so dense that the sides are steepening, getting steeper and steeper, and eventually you have this, this pit, this well, with essentially vertical sides. And nothing can climb out of this thing, in a sense, you can think of it this way, that because it loses all of its energy in doing so. Or you can say it just goes around and around like that. But in any case, a black hole is an extreme curvature of space and time, and nothing, not even light, or any material object can escape because its path is always wrapped around somehow. It can't get out to the outside world. So that's the idea of a black hole. And that was actually um, shown mathematically by Carl Schwarzschild just a few months after he received from Einstein himself the manuscript describing the mathematical general theory of relativity. Carl Schwarzschild applied it to very dense objects and in a sense showed that you could have a curvature of, of space and time that doesn't allow anything to exit. Um, these were later coined black holes by John Archibald Wheeler, a physicist, late physicist at, at Princeton University and a giant in the field. But Einstein himself, though he acknowledged Schwarzschild's mathematical solution, he thought it was just an interesting mathematical curiosity and that black holes don't actually exist in nature, that nothing actually achieves such an incredible density that it warps the space and time to such a great degree. Einstein thought that it was an interesting mathematical solution to his equations of general relativity. Well, what's inside a black hole? As soon as stuff is, falls in, it, it very quickly keeps on going down to the middle, at least in the case of a non-rotating black hole, and collapses to an infinitesimal point. I mean, in, in the theory of general relativity, it really is a point like mass, but uh, that's a point of infinite density, and we know that quantum effects will almost certainly affect that conclusion. So the singularity is probably not a mathematical point. It's just some very small, extraordinarily dense uh, blob of material, whatever material, fell into this black hole. So that's the answer to Einstein's question, uh, to, to Clinton's question, what's in a black hole? Well, in the middle there, it's not, depicted, it's not depicted in this diagram. You can't actually see the singularity in the way this is drawn. But, but, but what's in the black hole is the stuff that went into it, and it's the singularity, a point-like singularity in the case of a non-rotating black hole. So I said Einstein didn't believe that these things exist. How might they be formed? Well, we think that black holes might be formed in a number of ways. One way is related to exploding stars. Now, roughly once a day, somewhere in the sky, 
we see a bright burst of gamma rays, very high energy electromagnetic radiation, very high energy photons, roughly one a day. And research has shown that these so-called gamma ray bursts are probably a special kind of exploding star. Now here's a famous exploding star, supernova 1987A, which occurred uh, a little over 20 years ago. Um, actually, you know, plus 170,000 years or so, because this is in a galaxy that's 170,000 light years away. But anyway, February 23rd, 1987, we, we saw the light from it, and it revolutionized the field of, of supernova research. Anyway, certain kinds of these explosions, probably not this one, but certain varieties collapse in the middle to form a black hole, and two oppositely directed jets of very high speed particles that emit radiation. So, the cases in which this might happen are very massive stars, this is a simulation, that are rotating, and such rotating extremely massive stars collapse in their central region to a black hole. Material is falling in, releasing a lot of energy. Some of that energy gets channeled into two oppositely directed jets that pummel their way through the star, break through the surface, go out like this, and if our line of sight happens to be along one of the two jets, then we see a truly brilliant burst. And if our line of sight is not along one of the two jets, let me just show this again while I'm talking, then we see a more normal exploding star. Now you might say, what, exploding? It looks like it's imploding. Well, yes, the, the middle part implodes, but a lot of energy rele is released and the outer parts explode. That's true for a normal supernova as well. But in a normal core collapse supernova, the central region implodes to form a neutron star. Here we're saying it implodes even more to form a black hole. In the vicinity of the black hole, a bunch of particles get incredibly energized, pummel their way through along the path of least resistance, that's the rotation axis of the star, and go bursting out, seen as a gamma ray burst if we view them along the line of sight of this jet. So that would form, so that would mean that, that stellar mass black holes are the, or, or that, that gamma ray bursts are the birth cries of so-called stellar mass black holes. Another way it's thought that gamma ray bursts might form a black hole and two oppositely directed jets is if two neutron stars, that is, the remnants of more or less normal supernovae, spiral in together because they're releasing gravitational waves, <coughs> they merge to form a more massive object that, <coughs> that cannot be a neutron star, it's a black hole, and two oppositely directed jets go shooting off. Now, there's a flaw in this animation that NASA spent a lot of money and time on. Does anyone know what the flaw was? Anyone want to just yell it out? Ah, the, who said that? <laughs> Gentleman down here says the axis is wrong. Absolutely right. Watch. We're watching these things revolve around one another roughly along the line of sight. That is, they're in a plane perpendicular to the sky, okay? So the, so the jets should go off like, like that, okay, right? But instead they go off at an oblique angle. Watch. You know, if they're going to spend a lot of time and money making a fancy animation, and well, these are these are good animations, okay? They might as well get it right, you know. Anyway, but you get the idea. Once again, if we're looking along the line of sight of this jet, we see a very bright burst, and this too is thought to be one of the types of gamma ray bursts. And the two neutron stars together, when they merge, have too much mass to remain a neutron star, and so gra gravity is ultimately victorious, and these things collapse to form a black hole. So we think stellar mass black holes might be made in this way. Supermassive black holes might be made in the central regions of galaxies, giant collections of tens or even hundreds of billions of stars gravitationally bound together. We live in one such galaxy, the Milky Way, not this one, but another one. And in the central region, it could conceivably be that enough gas collects at the time of formation of the galaxy that it doesn't you know, form a bunch of stars, it just collapses catastrophically to form a black hole. People are working on the theory of how this might happen, and it's not exactly easy to do, but you could conceive of such a process, that there's so much mass in the middle of a galaxy that maybe it forms a black hole. Okay? So those are theoretical places we might expect the formation of black holes, not in Sid's room. Are they actually found? Where do you find black holes? How do you search for them? Well, you might just kind of look up at the sky and take lots and lots of photographs 
and look for arrows. And where you see arrows, you see in each case it's pointing to a dark spot. See, there and there and there. And you might say those are black holes, but you know, good try. If it were that easy, we, we wouldn't give degrees for this kind of work. I mean, a, a dark spot in the sky could simply indicate the absence of any stars or, or galaxies or lit up gas. So you can't just look up and say, oh, there's a black region, that must be a black hole. But it reminds me of the Sidney Harris joke, um, this cartoon, it's black and it looks like a hole, I'd say it's a black hole. And, and there it is up there, okay. And you know, I mean, it'd be cool if it were so easy to find such fascinating objects among the most fascinating objects in the universe. But again, if it were that easy, we probably wouldn't give degrees for black hole searches uh, in, in the modern era. I mean, this might have worked 50 years ago, but not anymore. <laughs> so it's got to be more difficult than that, OK? You can't directly see a black hole. So you detect it through its gravitational influence on nearby objects. So let's consider two stars that are going around each other. This is called a binary star. Many, many of the apparently single stars you see in the sky are actually binary stars like this. If you look at them through a telescope, you can see that there's two stars. Sometimes even through a telescope, it's not obvious that there are two stars, but if you take a spectrum of the apparently single star, you notice something interesting. You notice that, in fact, the spectrum, where you pass the light through a prism or a similar device, dispersing it into a rainbow of its component colors, including dark regions here, which are called absorption lines, which are due to elements in the relatively cool atmosphere of the star that absorb some of the light on its way out. So this pair of lines here is due to singly ionized calcium, for example. This pair here is due to neutral sodium. If you're a trained spectroscopist, you look at these patterns and you know what they mean. But anyway, most stars have only a single pattern of lines like this. But certain stars, you notice, have a doubling of the lines. For each line there, there's actually a pair. And if you take spectra over the course of a night, or many nights, or many months, or years, you notice the lines moving around. They crisscross back and forth like this. The one that was bluer initially becomes redder and vice versa. Okay, they're mirror images of one another. And they vary periodically with time. That indicates that what you're really looking at is the combined light of two stars. One star produces one set of absorption lines, the other star produces the other set, and when one of the stars is going toward you, its set of absorption lines is blue shifted, Doppler blue shifted, and the other star is going away from you, so its set of lines is Doppler red shifted, okay? And this is similar to the audible Doppler effect that you hear when, you, when there's a siren coming, okay? And it goes like that. When it's going towards you, it's kind of, let me turn on the light here. Uh, that's a little bit brighter now. Uh, it's just, it's so, I don't want people to fall asleep. <laughs> let me just turn on the light a little bit. But when you, when you hear um, a siren going like that, when it's coming towards you, the waves are kind of squished together between, because between any two successive wave crests, the object has moved toward you, and so those two wave crests are closer together than they would have been had it been stationary. So it's a shorter wavelength or a higher pitch, okay? And conversely, as the object is moving away from you, between two successive wave crests that it emits, it has moved away from you to some degree, so those wave crests are farther apart. So the wavelength is longer, <coughs> the pitch is lower. Now, if you hear a siren going, eeyah, 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 it doesn't mean that the driver is drunk and can't make up his mind which way to go. It just means that the siren doesn't have a constant pitch. But if you listen carefully, you can hear it go from a generally high-pitched eeyah to a generally low-pitched eeyah as it passes you. Okay? So that's the audible Doppler effect. And moving stars do the same thing. Light is a wave that is affected by um, the, the Doppler effect as well. So you want to look for a shifting set of, of lines, all right? But where do you look? I mean, there are millions, even billions of stars in our galaxy, and there's not enough telescope time available to take repeatedly spectra of all these stars searching for absorption lines that are going back and forth. Oh, and by the way, I forgot to mention this, but um, wh what does this have to do with black holes? Well, if one of these stars is massive and has already turned into a black hole, 
its mass is still there, okay? So it's still affecting the other star, okay? And so the other star, the red one there, will still be orbiting around something. They're actually orbiting around their common center of mass. But the, but the more massive star won't be visible because it's a black hole. So if you monitor the spectrum of this apparently single star and you see one pair of absorption lines, one set of absorption lines going back and forth without the complementary set doing the opposite. You see one set going back and forth. Then you know that this one star is orbiting something that's reasonably dark, whose signature you don't obviously see in the spectrum. And if the amount of the shift, both the speed and the period, are used or combined with Newton's laws to calculate the mass of the unseen object, and let's say you find that the mass of the unseen object is, you know, at least three or five or six or seven times the mass of the sun, then you could conclude that, well, if it were a normal star, it should be really bright because massive stars are very luminous, they're very powerful, and yet you don't see it in the spectrum. So then you might say, okay, maybe it's a dim star, like a neutron star, but neutron stars can't be three or more solar masses. And then you might say, well, maybe it's some other weird kind of star. Well, it turns out astronomers don't know of any weird kind of star or indeed any state of matter that can be so massive yet confined in a very small volume and not be visible. All massive things like stars that are in this pretty small volume are really quite bright. So if from the single set of absorption lines you can calculate that the invisible object is very massive, more massive than all other things we know of within a small volume, then you can conclude essentially by the process of elimination that, uh, that you found a black hole. But this is where I wanted to say you, you can't just monitor all stars because, you know, I, there's, there's too many stars to, to view. There's not enough telescopes and time available to monitor the spectra of all stars to find those that, are, that have a spectrum that's shifting in, in the telltale way. So you need a clue. And the clue is provided by X-rays, another form of high energy radiation. So the idea is this. Imagine you have a neutron star or a black hole, some very dense object, in orbit around another star. Actually, both are orbiting their common center of mass. The separation can be so small that this compact object, the neutron star or the black hole, can actually steal material away from the more normal star. And in the process of falling toward this compact object, the material heats up. That's because it speeds up because it's falling in a strong gravitational field and it's hitting all of its neighboring little particles of gas and a lot of that bulk kinetic energy gets turned into heat, okay, uh, into light. The objects heat up, the gas heats up and emits light. And in fact, there's so much energy released when something is falling into such a strong gravitational field that the gas in the disk, the so-called accretion disk around the compact object, heats up to very high temperatures in the inner regions. And it can emit X-rays, this high energy form of, of radiation that's used in, in the dentist's office and in the doctor's office to, to take, um, you know, to show imprints of your, of your bones and your teeth. And in the accretion disk, moreover, blobs of material can form and the, when the blobs go in toward the compact object, suppose an instability occurs and a blob falls toward it, a lot of energy is released in a very short amount of time. So you get a great brightening of the X-rays along with a brightening at other wavelengths of the electromagnetic spectrum, ultraviolet, optical, infrared, and so on. You get what's called an X-ray nova. And Satellites like the current Chandra X-ray Observatory can find these regions in the sky where suddenly, out of nowhere almost, a bright X-ray source appeared. And if you look closely there at a photograph at the same position taken months earlier, you might see that there was a faint star there. That star suddenly had an outburst, presumably because a clump of material fell in the secretion disk and let off <coughs> a lot of energy very quickly. Well, along with the X-rays, which are found um, through these surveys, you get optical light and ultraviolet and so on. And so you can sometimes see in a visible light photograph that the core 
corresponding object has brightened a lot at visible wavelengths as well. And here's such a nova. It's not one of the X-ray novas. It's a different kind of nova, but it was a convenient photograph that I had. You can just see that the star <coughs> has brightened tremendously. And that's because the accretion disk around the compact object has become very, very much brighter. Well, that's then a good candidate for a star orbiting a black hole. I mean, it might be orbiting a neutron star or some other rather dense object. But again, it's got to be dense because the local gravity had to be strong enough to heat up the gas sufficiently to give off x-rays. X-rays aren't given off in large quantities by more or less normal stars like our sun. I mean, our sun does emit x-rays, but not in gigantic amounts like this, OK? So you saw the accretion disk brighten. You then want it to fade so that you can see the more or less normal star again. And here's an example of one of these X-ray novae photographed at optical wavelengths after it had faded back to what we call quiescence. This was found by a Japanese satellite called Ginga in the 1980s. And my team said, ooh, cool, that's a black hole candidate. We will want to examine this thing once it fades that is, once the normal star is dominating the light of the accretion disk, then we could get a spectrum of the normal star, and indeed a series of spectra, and see if the lines are shifting around in such a way as to indicate the presence of a probable black hole. So my graduate students at the time and I, in 1995, used the first of the Keck telescopes. I always forget which one it is, but it's one of those two. Okay. And we took, over the course of one night, a series of spectra of this star that was at the location of the Ginga outburst some 10 years earlier, or seven years earlier. And here's a picture of the Keck 10 meter telescope mirror. It's made of 36 hexagonal segments arranged in a honeycomb. Each is about the size of a person, as you can see uh, by comparing with Fred Chaffee, a former director of Keck, sitting there. Um, by the way, he wasn't usually there when we were taking data. Uh, the extra light gathering power provided by his eyes is negligible compared to the collecting area of the telescope. But still, it makes for a good PR photo. These 36 segments work beautifully in unison, mimicking what would be seen with a single monolithic mirror, but at a fraction of the cost, at least, of the mirrors that were being made um, in the late 80s and the early 90s when, when the construction of the Kex was uh, being done. So this is a beautiful system. It collects light from faint stars and galaxies. My students and I were able to spread the light out with a, with a, a spectrograph and monitor the absorption lines. And what we found was the following plot. If you look at speed toward you or away from you, that's called radial velocity. Positive numbers are away from us. Negative numbers are toward us versus time, the spectrum of this star showed that, all right, at, at this moment of, moment of time, the star was moving away from us at 520 kilometers per second. Just a bit over four hours later, it was moving toward us at 520 kilometers per second. Then another four and a bit hours later, it was moving away from us again. And the points in between nearly perfectly follow a sine wave, a sinusoid. And this is the indication of a circular orbit. A circular orbit in projection to your line of sight, if you measure radial velocities, gives you this nice sine wave. And with an amplitude of 520 kilometers per second and a period of 8.3 hours, well, we could put this into Newton's formula and figure out the mass of the object that must be pulling on this visible star and in this case, the mass was at least five times the mass of the sun. And when you take into account the inclination angle, the more probable mass was eight times the mass of the sun, OK? Uh, and so this comfortably exceeds the maximum mass limit for a neutron star of three solar masses. And so we felt this was an excellent case for a black hole. In fact, when we get data like this, I'm a very happy camper. And now you see the real reason we build observatories in Hawaii. Um, I find these San Francisco Bay Area waters to be too cold for swimming without a wetsuit. And wetsuits are kind of a pain, so I like to go to Hawaii. 
Now, of course, there's good scientific reasons for building telescopes in Hawaii as well, but it's nice that it's a, a nice area to visit. So, you know, it says, you see astronomers observe black hole in Milky Way, it may be 14 times as dense as the sun. They meant as massive, not as dense. Uh, and and, and that, that's an upper limit. I told the guy the upper limit is 14, the lower limit is 5, and later we determined that the most probable mass is 8, but whatever. Um, so there it is. Now, more recently, graduate student Jeff Silverman, who introduced me and I, studied a star in a nearby galaxy called IC10. And again, it was one of these X-ray sources. It was a star that's emitting X-rays. And, <coughs> and in particular, <coughs> excuse me, occasionally it goes through bursts. So we thought this was a good candidate for a black hole. But in fact, the main reason we observed it is that another team had said that not only is it a good candidate for a stellar mass black hole, but it's the most massive stellar mass black hole ever found, 20 or possibly even 30 times the mass of the sun. And I looked at their data, and frankly, I didn't believe that their data were very convincing. And in fact, I thought they were wrong. And so I said to Jeff, why don't we you know, observe this thing? And it's not that I want to sit around proving people wrong, by the way. Let me just turn on the light for a second so you can see that I'm a nice guy while I'm saying this, OK? <laughs> I don't want to just sit around proving people wrong, OK? But this made big headlines. And moreover, a 20 or 30 solar mass stellar black hole would be a big deal because, in fact, all the ones that have been found up to then have been 5 to 15 or so, maybe 17, maybe 3, a range kind of like that, solar masses. And so finding the biggest one would be very interesting, OK? And, and if they're wrong, you know, then we shouldn't make a big deal of it. Well, we took data, and lo and behold, they were right. And this thing is a 20 or 30 solar mass black hole. But now people actually believe it. I mean, I've, Jeff and I have received many email messages from people saying, we're glad you did this because we didn't believe those guys either. OK, so uh, anyway, uh, so that's the most massive known uh, stellar mass black hole. Actually, I kind of like those little lights there. Um, it's been too dark otherwise. OK. Uh, the, the, there's now been maybe two or three dozen of these stellar mass black hole candidates found. And you might say, well, they're only candidates because we haven't actually shown that there's a black hole there. But there's an interesting bit of evidence uh, that supports the idea that these things are black holes. There are objects where the mass suggests that the compact object is a black hole, and there are objects where the mass suggests that it's only a neutron star, having roughly one and a half times the mass of the sun. It turns out that when you have a neutron star present, and material from the accretion disk is falling in during quiescence, that is, at a more or less steady state, not during one of these big outbursts when a clump falls. But during quiescence, a little bit of stuff is falling onto the neutron star. And if there's a neutron star there, it's hitting a solid surface. And the kinetic energy, the bulk kinetic energy, gets converted into light and heat, OK? So you expect, in quiescence, the neutron stars to be glowing, all right? In the case of a black hole, the material is falling in, and yeah, it's emitting sunlight because it's rubbing against other material and it's hot, but it's never hitting a solid surface because the black hole's event horizon, the boundary, the point of no return, has no long-lived concentration of matter. Stuff just goes through the event horizon on the way to singularity. So when stuff falls through the event horizon of a black hole, there's no extra energy released, okay? So those systems where you really do have a black hole are thought to be, theoretically at least, expected to be fainter in quiescence than those systems where you have a neutron star. And lo and behold, when you look at the set of several dozen objects, those where the masses suggest a black hole and those where the masses suggest a neutron star, you indeed find that the neutron star candidates are brighter in quiescence than the black hole candidates. That suggests that the black hole candidates really are black holes and that material isn't hitting a solid surface, but rather is going through the event horizon and being swallowed up. So this is additional evidence that these dynamically identified stellar mass black holes really are black holes. Now let me turn quickly to supermassive black holes. Um, I'll say quickly because there's another chance you'll have to hear about these things in about a month, and I'll advertise that in a few minutes. But if you look at galaxies like this, I said earlier that we expect there might be black holes in their central regions, giant ones that resulted from the collapse of a whole lot of gas into the central region. Um, the signature would once again be rapid motions of stars. So if you look at the central part of a galaxy, the nucleus of a galaxy, 
without a black hole, there's lots of stars there, and they're all pulling on one another, and so the stars are moving pretty rapidly. But if, in addition, you have a black hole, then you have additional mass there, not just the mass of the stars, but the mass of the black hole as well, and that causes an even faster motion of the stars in the vicinity of this nucleus, okay? So you could look at the central regions of galaxies, measure the speeds of the stars collectively. I mean, you can't see the individual stars the way we did for stellar mass black hole uh, companions, but you look at the collective motions of a bunch of stars in a lot of galaxies, and you can see whether there's a black hole there or not by, um, by looking at whether the motions are pretty fast or, uh, or really fast. Well, there is one galaxy in which, in fact, you can see the individual stars and do the, the same sort of thing as with uh, the stellar mass black hole candidates that I just discussed. And that's the central part of our own galaxy. Now, it's about 26,000 light years away within that green square, and you actually can't see it at optical wavelengths because there's a bunch of interstellar smog, mostly dust, that blocks our view of the central region. But at infrared wavelengths, and especially at radio wavelengths, you can see the central region. And it's just like on a foggy day, you can hear your local radio station, but you might not be able to see buildings that are just a couple of blocks away. That's because optical light is blocked by fog and dust, whereas radio waves, and to a lesser extent, um, infrared, are not blocked. So it turns out Reinhard Gensel, who has a joint appointment here at Berkeley and also at the Max Planck Institute in Germany, and Andrea Gez, a professor at UCLA, have for the past 20 years been monitoring the central region of our Milky Way galaxy at infrared wavelengths. So there it is, it's in that square there. They use a process called adaptive optics that allows you to largely negate or compensate for the turbulent effects of our atmosphere, and that allows you to see lots and lots of stars, individual stars, with great clarity in the central tiny bit of our galaxy. Okay, so there's the center of our galaxy blown up, and you can see the actual stars, all right? By taking pictures like this, using adaptive optics, and earlier they used other related techniques, they could get a snapshot over time of the positions of all these galaxies. And what both teams found was that the stars are moving around really quickly. Zoom, zoom, I love that one, zoom. I love that one too, because by now it's completed a whole orbit. The orbit is about 15 years long. Look at that, watch this, zoom, zoom, zoom. Look at that, I mean, it's just beautiful. They're going around something, something dark, okay? Um, and it's marked with a red cross. It's probably a black hole, and it's good to have a red cross station anywhere near a black hole. <laughs> it might tear you apart, as I'll discuss in a few minutes. But the point is, is that other than the red cross that was pasted in by, by you know, Adobe Photoshop or something, uh, there's nothing obvious there, and yet these stars are clearly responding to some mass that's there. I mean, you can analyze these orbits, again, using simple Newtonian physics. This doesn't require general relativity, and even if it did, General relativity is, is uh, pretty well confirmed on these scales. And you can calculate the mass responsible for the observed orbits of these stars, and that mass is four million times the mass of our sun, yet it's within a volume no bigger than about our solar system. And you can tell that because the one that comes in along a radial orbit, boom, that one there, it gets within, or maybe the other one, the one with the 15-year orbit, uh, that one up there, one of those two gets within about a solar system diameter of, of whatever is there at that red cross, okay? And, and the orbit, the trajectory is acting in a way that's consistent with whatever being there being a consistent with a point-like source. In other words, not all extended like, you know, some galaxy or something, but but all the material, the four million times the mass of the sun, is co <coughs> consistent with being compressed in a point at the position of the Red Cross, okay? This is the single best piece of evidence we have for the existence of black holes. This is even better evidence than the stellar mass black holes because uh, it's a bigger mass in a very, very small volume. And uh, if you wanna hear more about this, in just a, a, about a month, in fact, on Wednesday, March 30th, 
the Sackler Lecture will be Professor Gaz from UCLA, and she'll give you the details of all this, uh, of her wonderful research on, uh, uh, on uncovering the, the black hole in the middle of our galaxy, and that'll be in Sibley Auditorium, which is just, just um, like a stone's throw from here, and it's, again, free at 5 o'clock. So, with the Hubble Space Telescope, and also Keck and other telescopes, We've looked at the collective motions of stars in a bunch of other galaxies. In other galaxies, you know, they're so far away we can't see the individual stars. But the collective motions of stars and gas in this galaxy, M87 in the Virgo cluster, about 60 million light years away, indicates the presence of a, of a massive, very compact object in the middle there, having a mass of three to six, or possibly even seven billion solar masses. Uh, the conventional number was three. Um, for the past 10 years, but recently an, an interest, a, a team at, at the University of Texas at Austin has, has done some work that suggests that actually the mass might be more like six or even seven billion solar masses, and we'll need to see whether other studies confirm this, but their study looks pretty reliable to me. So um, this could be a six or even seven billion solar mass black hole, a supermassive black hole that dwarfs by a factor of a thousand the one in our own galaxy. The Sombrero Galaxy, black hole with 700 million solar masses right there in the middle. Again, you can't see it, but the collective motion of the stars suggests that it's there, okay? And then the Andromeda galaxy, our near sister in our local group, just two and a half million light years away, in many ways very much like our galaxy, but it contains a much bigger black hole than our Milky Way. So that's one way, at least, in which the Milky Way and Andromeda differ. We have a 4 million solar mass black hole, and they have a 140 million solar mass black hole, for whatever reason. We're still not quite sure. Okay, But this general trend that galaxies, especially ones with big, bulgy parts like this, it doesn't so matter uh, so much matter what the disk looks like, but if you've got a big, bulgy part like that, then you almost always have a, a black hole. So black holes apparently do form in the central regions of big galaxies. And this nicely helps explain or confirms a hypothesis that's nearly 50 years old, and that is that certain galaxies called active galaxies that have very bright central regions compared with normal bat galaxies, well, the hypothesis was that those central regions are bright because there's a supermassive black hole there swallowing material in the immediate vicinity, and that material rubs against other material, heats up, and emits a bunch of light while it's still outside the black hole. Now, the press often gets this wrong. They say that active galaxies are emitting a whole bunch of light from within the black hole. No, from within the neighborhood of the black hole, a lot of light gets emitted if material is falling into a strong gravitational field. And this was postulated in the early to mid-60s, mid-60s actually, as being the explanation for active galaxies and quasars, a very extreme form of active galaxy where the nucleus is very bright, in fact so bright that often it's difficult to see the galaxy itself. You only see the nucleus, and in fact when these things were first discovered, they looked like stars, yet they emitted all sorts of radio and other radiation, so they were called quasi-stellar radio sources, or quasars for short. And we now know that they are the central regions of galaxies, and there's a black hole in that central region swallowing a lot of material in the process, emitting a lot of light, and in a manner that's somewhat reminiscent of the gamma ray burst jets, the particles in the vicinity of the black hole can become so energized that some of them try to escape because there's such a high pressure region, and they escape along their path of least resistance, which might be along, say, the magnetic field lines if this, thing, this whole thing is magnetized. Or it might be along the axis of a nozzle in this accretion disk. So here's a bunch of material spiraling in toward the black hole, and there's a bunch of energized particles here, because all this material has been falling in. Some of them are trying to escape, but it's hard to escape through the accretion disk, it's easier to escape along the axis of rotation of this whole system where there's relatively little material. So you get these jets. So, you know, decades ago, black holes were proposed as the explanation for quasars and active galaxies. Now that we've found supermassive black holes in quiescent galaxies, well, that, that nicely fits with the idea because 
once the gas is used up in the quasar, then the black hole is still there, but the environment of the black hole no longer shines very brightly because it only shines while it's eating material, and there's no more, or at least very little, material left to eat. So all this evidence, the active galaxies and quasars, the direct evidence, or, well, direct dynamical evidence for supermassive black holes in the middle of galaxies, the evidence for stellar mass black holes, it's overwhelming. I mean, I'd be willing to bet my house that black holes really do exist. And that's actually not such a hard bet because I rent, it turns out. But <laughs> nevertheless, even if I were to own a house, I, I think I'm confident enough in the existence of black holes to, to bet my, my house. Probably not my life, because you know some clever whippersnapper someday may figure out a way in which matter can be compressed into a very small volume, but slightly bigger than the event horizon of a black hole in which case this thing wouldn't really be a black hole, but very close. So I'm not saying that that can't be the case. We still have more work to do to prove the existence of black holes, but the evidence is becoming extraordinarily good, largely because we can't figure out anything, anything else that this thing could be, and we, we think we understand the properties of matter pretty well by this point. So Einstein you know, was perhaps sad that <laughs> one of the most wonderful mathematical consequences of his general theory of relativity is that black holes could exist, but he didn't think that nature has a way of actually producing them, right? He just thought it was a mathematical curiosity. It's a, a possibility in the universe that the universe chooses not to adopt because there's no place where, you know, there's no vice strong enough to create black holes. So he's maybe sad that black holes don't actually exist. But imagine what his reaction would be if he were alive right now and presented with all this evidence for black holes, is it, you know, <laughs> his reaction might be something like this. You know, I don't know. Um, a few more minutes here. I just want to tell you a few more things and then have some time for Q&A. Let me first dispel some myths. There's a lot of myths around about black holes. The first is, again, really related to that, uh, to that um, reading card I showed you earlier. Here's another one that's suddenly through forces not yet fully understood. Darren Belsky's apartment became the center of a new black hole. And, you know, Darren and his dog and his wife were all being pulled in. So anyway, again, don't worry. You know, be happy. We don't think that there's any way that black holes can form other than the collapse of a massive star, the central part of a galaxy, maybe the collapse of the central part of a star cluster, maybe by little fluctuations in matter shortly after the Big Bang. That's more controversial. But uh, in any case, not in Darren Belsky's or Sid's room. So don't worry about that. The next um, popular misconception is that if the sun were to turn into a black hole, which it won't, it'll turn into a thing called a white dwarf in uh, about 7 billion years or so uh, after it's a red giant and a planetary nebula. It'll become a white dwarf, the, the retired remains of our star that'll just kind of shine for almost forever, ever, ever fainter as it uses up the energy that's inside it. But it's not massive enough to, to form a black hole, so it won't. But if it were to form a black hole, you know, I wouldn't really care much. Well, gravitationally, that is. I mean, I would care that there's no light and heat, you know. I mean, this is what we, we need, okay. But gravitationally, the Earth doesn't care whether the sun is the sun or a black hole of the same mass. Because we're so far away from the sun that the Newtonian description of gravity is just fine, and we're in a nice stable orbit around the sun, and that would be the case even if the sun were to have the same mass but be compressed into an even smaller thing called a black hole. You only really fear being sucked into a black hole if you're very close to it. Or, you know, if you stop yourself dead in your tracks, all right, then you'll fall into a black hole. But gosh, if we stop the Earth dead in its tracks, it would fall into the sun as well. So again, that's, that's no different. Out here, gravity is no different than um, what it is um, for, the, for the regular sun. So it's only near a black hole that uh, you have to worry, okay? But in any case, don't worry. Now, if you want to study a black hole, you can choose wisely or you can choose poorly, okay? It turns out that those small black holes <coughs> have a smaller <coughs> radius by the way, the radius is given by 2 times Newton's constant g times the mass of a black hole divided by the square of the speed of light, 2 gm over c squared. And for the sun, the so-called Schwarzschild radius would be only 3 kilometers, 2 miles. 
So the sun would be a really puny black hole if it were a black hole. And, you know, again, you have to aim pretty close to it to get close enough to be sucked in. Now, the mass of a black hole, um, of a supermassive black hole, can be a million or even a billion times bigger than the mass of the sun. So its radius would be a million to a billion times bigger. You might think that makes it more dangerous. Well, it's still a pretty small object. I mean, you know, two million miles is still much less than the distance from the sun to the Earth. So even supermassive black holes are pretty small. But they're less dangerous, it turns out, than stellar mass black holes. Because here's what can happen. Especially near a stellar mass black hole, the force on your feet being significantly closer to the center of the black hole than your head the force on your feet is stronger than the force on your head or on your torso. So this big F is bigger, considerably bigger than little f, because, you know, I have a height of about six feet or so compared to two miles for a stellar mass black hole. That's actually significant. I mean, six feet doesn't sound significant compared to two miles, but when you're in such a strong gravitational field with a, such a strong warping of space, the six extra feet that my feet are closer to the black hole, or two meters on the metric system, that's significant compared to three kilometers, or even 30 kilometers for a 10 solar mass black hole. So I get stretched, okay, like this. And as you get closer and closer to the event horizon, you get stretched more and more. You get torn apart. You get broken in half, and then into quarters, and eighths, and so on. The official name for this is spaghettification, okay? You get <laughs> spaghettified because you get stretched into a form of human spaghetti, kind of like, okay? Now, near a supermassive black hole, as long as you avoid its bigger size, you can be reasonably close to it, and the difference in the force on your feet compared to your upper body, the so-called differential force, the tidal force, F minus F, is much smaller than in the vicinity of a stellar mass black hole because compared to 2 million miles or 20 million miles, the six feet of my height are, uh, are, are pretty insignificant, and so the differential force is much less, and so the stretching effect is less. So if you want to do a PhD thesis on black holes, you youngsters here who are going through the ranks now and want to pursue astrophysics, black holes are a really cool subject. If you want to study one, you know, from close by, Choose wisely, okay? Choose a supermassive black hole around which you can orbit safely. Don't choose a stellar mass black hole because you'll be ripped apart. And in any case, don't go inside because, you know, in either case, you'll, you'll never get back out. Now, uh, the final, well, one of the things I wanted to mention near the end also is that black holes can evaporate. Um, I nearly used up my time. And this is described in, in Hawking's book, A Brief History of Time. I like to say that this is the most purchased but least read through completion <laughs> book in existence because people buy it and after about chapter two or three it becomes pretty heavy going and so people stop reading it and, but they put it on their coffee table and they have dinner parties and people say, oh wow, you read Stephen Hawking, you must be really smart. Oh, yes, yes. Anyway, anyway, so very few people understand it but, uh, but he describes this process by which black holes might evaporate and it has to do with the fact that quantum physics allows particles and antiparticles to form out of nothing for a short time, and then a short time later, they disappear again. It's called quantum fluctuations. Quantum mechanics also allows tunneling through objects, which is a related process. So either by considering quantum fluctuations or by considering tunneling, uh, or a number of other techniques, these are all related, Hawking realized that black holes can evaporate. You can have these particle pairs forming inside the black hole and annihilating. Those don't do much of anything. And similarly, outside, they don't do much of anything. But if you have a pair that forms outside and one of them goes in, then the other is free to escape out to infinity. And that looks like particles that are coming out from the black hole. It's losing mass. From our perspective, the one that goes in, and it doesn't matter whether it's the electron or the positron, either way, it goes in from our perspective with negative mass. It's, it's, it's relativity at its essence. Things depend on your, on your frame of reference. And in our frame of reference, these guys are going in with what's called a negative mass. Or if you don't like that, just imagine a particle created here, and it can tunnel its way out. It's kind of like I can break through this 
this wall here without even noticing it, without getting hurt if I hit it enough times. Now, I'm not going to do this because the age of the universe would have to be much, much greater before the probability became reasonably high that I'd even make it through once unscathed. So for a big particle, it's very rare. But for little particles, tunneling is really quite common. And in fact, radioactive decay is a form of tunneling of particles out of a, an atomic nucleus. So these things can decay, they can evaporate, but the process is exceedingly slow for stellar mass black holes and even more so uh, for supermassive black holes. Indeed, they're swallowing material faster than they're um, evaporating, much faster. But Hawking postulates that there might be little tiny black holes called mini black holes left over from the Big Bang. And those that are about the size of a mountain might be exploding right now in a burst of high energy radiation, gamma rays. Unfortunately for Hawking, the observed gamma ray bursts are unlikely to be evaporating black holes. They don't have the right observed properties. When I describe this process to my class here at Cal, I dress up as a black hole, kind of like this, but I have a, a hood and a cape. Some people say that I look like a Unabomber. But anyway, uh, who is known here to Berkeley, he used to be an assistant professor of mathematics in the late 60s here. Um, anyway, I have a bucket of celestially themed candy taped to me, okay? Orbit gum, eclipse gum, Mars bars, Milky Way bars, starbursts, you know, gotta use celestially themed candy. And I throw this stuff out to the, to the students to illustrate in a pretty graphic way this quantum evaporation of black holes. And um, they may not totally understand it, but they remember it. Even 20 years later, students have come back to me and they say, you know, I don't remember a darn thing from your class, except when you dressed up as a black hole. And, uh, and, uh, so uh, finally, suppose you want to throw your enemy toward a black hole. So you're Luke Skywalker, let's say, and, and you're fighting Darth Vader, and you want to throw Darth Vader into a black hole, and Darth says, but Luke, I'm your father. And you say, well, I, I don't care. You've been a bad person. And, and then you say, well, no, really, I should throw the emperor into the black hole. It's, it's really the emperor who's the root of all evil, and Darth was a good guy initially, right? Anyway, let's not get into that. You throw Darth, although I should get, for the next talk I give, a picture of the emperor. And you want to you wanna see him, you know, be devoured by this black hole. Well, what would you actually see? Turns out, you would see his clock slow down. And this is an interesting relativistic effect. It's related to the warping of space I talked to. But near a black hole, or even a neutron star, or even the Earth to some degree, clocks that are closer in, that is deeper in the gravitational field, run at a slower rate than clocks that are farther away. And so near a black hole, this effect is quite strong. Um, four hours may go by on the clock far from the black hole, and only two hours will have gone by on the clock near the black hole. We actually use this um, in the GPS system of satellites. You have to, the engineers who built them and designed them had to take into account what physicists told them, and that is that the clocks up there are running at a slightly different rate than the clocks down here. You have to take that into account, otherwise GPS wouldn't get you to the right location. It wouldn't tell you correctly where you are. So this is a known effect, okay? But near a black hole, it's quite extreme. Clocks slow down, and the closer Darth Vader gets to the event horizon, the boundary of the black hole, the slower time passes until time comes to a stop when Darth Vader is right at the event horizon. So Luke Skywalker wouldn't actually have the pleasure of seeing Vader pass through the event horizon because it takes an infinite amount of time to do so from our perspective. Again, this is relativity. Um, at its essence, okay? The, the, the rate at which time passes depends on your frame of reference, okay? So it would appear that Darth Vader never falls in, okay? Now, from Vader's perspective, he does fall in. And in fact, he gets crushed in the singularity after being spaghettified, by the way, a short time after crossing the event horizon. But from our perspective, from Luke's perspective, he never falls in. Indeed, nothing ever falls into a black hole from our perspective. It becomes plastered on a thin membrane just outside the event horizon because all the clocks have slowed down so much. Now, suppose Vader turns on his most powerful rockets and escapes from the vicinity of the black hole before crossing the event horizon. Because he will have spent some time near the black hole, yet that time is passing more slowly than for people still on Earth or in whatever spaceship is way out there, Vader will have aged less than Luke 
And then when he comes back to battle him, he might be, relatively speaking, stronger if Luke is really old and frail, you know. <laughs> Vader is still, you know, strong and they have equal lightsabers. Anyway, the, the, the point is, is that this is a method for jumping into the future without aging very much. You can't read more books or see a thousand years worth of movies or whatever, but you can jump a thousand years into the future while only aging a year or two, or even less, depending on how close you are to the black hole and how much time you spent there in your own frame of reference. So this is an actual real physical effect. And uh, in fact, astronauts who have spent up to two years up in space, a couple of Russian cosmonauts spent two years in space, they aged 1 49th of a second less than the rest of us who stayed here at home. Yep, um, that's right. The, the record is 1 48th or 1 49th of a second. In any case, if you get that close, because you want to jump far into the future, and the farther you want to jump in the shortest amount of time in your frame of reference, that means the closer you have to be to the black hole. Be careful not to fall in, okay, because you need really strong rockets near the, the horizon. And if you do fall in, abandon all heap, all, all hope, ye who enter here. So finally, I'm sorry I'm a bit over. Hope there's time for questions. But to summarize, theoretical physicists basically said that black holes could exist. I mean, they are consistent with the equations of general relativity. Observational astronomers show that they do exist. Typically millions of them in a galaxy our size, stellar mass black holes that came from the collapse of certain types of most massive stars, and then one big black hole having, uh, having millions or even billions of solar masses in the middle of most galaxies. Black holes are detected not by the light that they emit, but by light that is emitted in their vicinity by gas and dust and, and other stuff, and also by the gravitationally induced motions of things near them, stars or disks of gas. Small black holes have greater tidal effects than big black holes. In that sense, they're more dangerous, and black holes can evaporate, but the process is negligible, except for the hypothetical mini black holes. So that's the thing. Uh, I wanted to end by saying that <laughs> Berkeley, of course, is always in need of funds, and in particular in astronomy, we, uh, we're always looking for donations. You can go to the astro.berkeley.edu website, and there's a little place there where you can click support if you want to support the many, many worthy programs that we have. Um, and if you want to learn more about astronomy in general, I have some courses with the teaching company, which right now are not on sale, but occasionally they go on sale. You can monitor teach12.com, and when they're on sale, the teaching company nearly gives them away. For example, 12 lectures on black holes for just 40 bucks. Thank you very much, and I'll be happy to answer your questions. So Paul Frampton at, at the University of North Carolina has been advocating intermediate mass black holes as dark matter for many years. Yeah. And there's actual observational evidence now that the Rossi X-ray timing observations have confirmed a 500 solar mass black hole in M82X1. Yeah. And all the other uh, dark matter theorists have zero evidence for the axions that they keep looking for, except for the uh, possibility that supersymmetry in the particle zoo would be out. Yeah, yeah. So if dark matter is intermediate mass black holes, yeah. what, what are the implications for slingshot navigation in terms of expected time to traverse distances on the order of 50 light years? And also, what are the prospects of observing uh, gravitational lensing patterns against the 5.7 micron yeah. first so spectral line pattern? So I didn't have time <coughs> to talk about intermediate mass black holes, although I I hinted at them parenthetically when I said that certain star clusters might collapse. Indeed, there, there's some evidence, uh, but not yet great evidence, for the existence of black holes having masses of a few hundred to a few thousand solar masses. They might form in the central regions of star clusters in a way similar to that of, um, of, of the central masses of galaxies. I would say that Frampton's uh, reasons for introducing these black holes, that they make up a lot of the dark matter of the universe, are probably not correct because we have other independent pieces of evidence that most of the dark matter is not made of any sort of things that are normal atoms or were ever normal atoms. In other words, his intermediate mass black holes couldn't have formed in clusters because clusters are made of stars that are made of normal atoms, and, and we have evidence that that, you know... He says they're primordial. Yeah, okay, so he says they're primordial. Well, you know, 
Right, that's at least good. But we don't even yet have evidence for primordial little tiny black holes, the Hawking variety, and really big ones having 100 or 1,000 solar masses. I just don't see how they would form. Nevertheless, <clears throat> if they were to form, I'm not sure that we could use them in any sort of a gravitational slingshot because, again, they're very rare, and we're not e even close to, to traveling to even the nearest star. Uh, in terms of gravitational lensing, yeah, they might lens background objects, but um, you know, the lensing effect for, for such a black hole is much smaller than the lensing effect for, say, a cluster of galaxies, oh. and so it would be just a small effect. Instead, Let me take some other questions, because that was a, a long and very interesting question, but I want one from one, one of the younger uh, people of the audience here. Yes? If stars move, how can people follow the North Star? Yeah, that's an interesting question. Okay, so stars move in a galaxy only very slowly on a human time scale. So forget about that effect. Stars don't move very much during you know the times that we're looking at them. They appear to move in the sky because the Earth is rotating. Okay, and it rotates about its axis once every 24 hours. Okay, and so just like the sun. <coughs> rises in the east and sets in the west, so too you can see the stars rising in the east and setting in the west. And over the course of a night, they move a lot. But if you think about it, our Earth is rotating around an axis called our pole. And if you extend the pole out, outwards toward the stars, there are stars right next to the pole, in particular a, a star called the North Star, Polaris, that moves only very little, almost not at all, because it's so close to the axis of rotation that if you're, if you're looking up along the axis of rotation, the circle over which it goes in the sky is very, very small. So it always remains as a good pointer for where north is. And, and indeed, it, it's an important point of reference for, for navigation. Now, if you know what time it is, then you can use other stars as well for navigation. And, and early navigators, knowing what time it was and knowing where the stars should be at a certain time from certain locations on Earth, could figure out where they are on Earth based on where the star appears, even though it does move across the sky. If you know what time it is, you can figure things out, OK? Does that, does that answer your question? Good, good, OK. Uh, yes, another young fellow then, yeah. Oh, what happens when two supermassive black holes collide? That is a great question and an area of really active research. They merge together to form an even bigger black hole. And you might ask, what is the observational evidence? Well, so far, we've seen galaxies that appear to be merging, and each of them may well have a black hole, and someday those will merge. But We've never actually seen the process of merging, because it's rare and it's hard to see, especially since the black holes themselves don't emit any light. But physicists are designing instruments called gravitational wave detectors that will detect the very turbulent and rapid distortions in the shape of space that occur when two giant black holes merge. They're called gravitational waves. And there are some gravitational wave detectors on Earth right now already that could detect the merging of two stellar mass black holes or two neutron stars. We don't yet have gravitational wave detectors that could detect the merging of supermassive black holes. But there's a planned satellite called LISA that might be built in the next 20 years if we're lucky, if NASA doesn't run out of money, right? NASA has a lot of things to do and everyone's broke, okay? But LISA could detect the gravitational radiation from merging supermassive black holes. The next new big window in astrophysics, indeed, is the detection and study of gravitational waves. And maybe that's something you'd be interested in studying later on. Yes? Yes. So I always thought of jets as being just two jets coming out, um, you know, the size, uh, one dimensional, basically. But your rotating figure suggested that the jets might be coming out in a plane rather than those two points. Could you clarify? Yeah, the, the jets and whether they're coming out in a plane. It, it's along the axis of rotation of either the rapidly rotating massive star, and that's definitely a line or a fuzzy line, not a plane, 
Or I think the confusion may have occurred when when the two neutron stars were orbiting and merging together due to gravitational waves. Though they're orbiting each other in a plane, when they merge, the object that they merge to form is rotating. It's, it's rotating in the same sense of direction as the two objects were revolving around one another. But again, um, material probably exits along two oppositely directed pencil beams, and that's, and that's because during the merging process, the two objects actually get torn apart. They get highly disrupted, and so the merging process is messy, and for a very short time forms a disk. And there's a nozzle along that disk, kind of like in the picture of the active galaxy that I showed. So any high energy particles that are trying to escape would have a hard time escaping along the equatorial plane, but a much easier time escaping along the rotation axis. So we do think it's a, a fuzzy line or a pencil beam in both cases. Yes? Go ahead, in the very back there. Yes? The idea that the black hole is consuming matter. That black hole is consuming matter, but some of the matter gets energized in the vicinity of the black hole, and so that matter can escape. So material is both being eaten by a black hole and escaping from the vicinity of the black hole in certain special directions, the directions of these jets. <coughs> what, what kind of matter is based up? If you're saying you have a cold atom and a certain uh, dimensionality of it. Yeah. So if, if we're squishing everything to this point where it's... So the singularity. Yeah. Right. Unrecognizable. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so the gentleman was asking, you know, what happens to the state of matter, you know, like gold atoms, or uranium, or, or carbon, when they get squished in the singularity? Uh, we, we don't know in detail because we don't yet have um, a, an understanding of the state of matter at such high densities from an experimental point of view. The point is we, we can't reproduce the black hole conditions in a lab, and that's, that's probably a good thing. But it also <laughs> means that, you know, it shows why astrophysics is important because it allows us to extend our understanding of the laws of physics by observing, you know, laboratories out there that are not in our basement. So the, 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 the true answer is we don't know what the state of matter is, but we can guess. And certainly all gold and other atoms lose any sense of identity. All their neutrons and protons merge together. Indeed, even neutrons and protons are big compared to the quantum scale that's thought to be associated with the singularity, which is orders and orders of magnitude smaller than a proton. So presumably, everything gets squished into a state of matter that cannot yet be defined and certainly not described experimentally. But it's definitely lost all the constituent properties of its particles, protons, neutrons, and electrons. I saw, uh, yes, over there. Mm -hmm. So this is the normal matter interacting with black holes, but what about the other matter that we don't know? <coughs> Yeah, so what about dark matter and stuff and dark energy? Yeah, so dark matter can be eaten by black holes. Um, in fact, black holes are a form of dark matter. They're a form of dark matter that resulted from the collapse of normal atoms and stuff, okay? As I was saying, there's other evidence we have that most dark matter has to be of a type that was never made of atoms. But in any case, suppose you have a black hole, which is a form of dark matter. Things that come by can get eaten. And the, the various, you know, little particles, axions and things that the other gentleman was mentioning, it's true, have not been detected. We, we think they exist based on the physics of the early universe. Um, they're kind of all over the place. So if they encounter a black hole, they'll get eaten. But that dark matter is so uniformly spread out in a galaxy that you know very little of it is getting eaten. The dark energy, the repulsive effect that's accelerating the expansion of the universe, is even more uniformly spread out. At least the dark matter, to, to the degree that we can tell, it tends to coalesce where, where luminous matter is. So in other words, galaxies have lots of dark matter, and clusters of galaxies have lots of dark matter, but the space between clusters of galaxies doesn't have much dark matter. Dark energy is really uniformly spread out. And its density, its amount per unit volume, is so incredibly low that, yes, although it gets eaten by black holes, only a very small amount of it gets eaten. So most of the matter in black holes, in real black holes that we know of, almost certainly came from the collapse of stars 
or from the disruption of stars and the eating of stars that come near it, or from the collapse of gas in the middle of a galaxy at or near the time of its formation. Yes. Okay. Yeah. You talk about this is great. You guys are asking great questions. You by the way, talk about black a black hole in the middle of our universe. There, not, there's no middle of our universe. The middle of our galaxy. Oh, okay. okay. Middle of our galaxy. Big difference, actually. I just wanted could to clarify that. Yeah. Could the black hole be an affecting force which holds the galaxy? Yeah. Could, could the black hole in the middle of our galaxy be the be the glue that holds our galaxy together? Basically, no. And that that's because our galaxy has a mass of something like a hundred billion times the mass of our sun. Okay, even more than that. The middle part, the black hole, is only four million compared to a hundred billion. So that's a factor of you know twenty-five thousand more. Okay. So the black hole in the middle of the galaxy definitely affects and dominates the motions of the stars in its immediate vicinity, which is why professors Genzel and Gaz can do their studies. Okay, and, and even show that what's doing it is a point source or consistent with a point source. But out at our distance of 26,000 light years, we're, you know, our motion around the center of our galaxy is dominated by the sum total of the mass of the regular stars and dark matter and a little bit of gas that's within our stellar orbit. So we are affected only by a minute amount by the black hole in the middle of the galaxy. Yes? So I was intrigued by your, your point about Clock slowing down and are not ever being able to see anything yeah, go yeah. to a black hole. Well, if that's the case, how you keep talking about black holes eating things? How do they? Ever yeah. So, so black holes. Oh, great, young people as well. Good. Um, so black holes are are eating material, but from our point of view, the definition of eating simply means the material becomes spread over an infinitesimal thin sheet around the event horizon. But that means the event horizon doesn't actually get any bigger. Well, the event horizon does get bigger, it turns out, as more stuff piles onto it. Because the black hole's short shield radius, 2 gm over c squared, really is getting bigger. That means this membrane is moving outward. Now, mind you, we've never seen the membrane. The membrane is very thin and, more importantly, becomes very faint for a couple of reasons. First of all, the, matter, the, the light that's escaping from this membrane is escaping um, very slowly. It's not that the light is moving any less slowly than, than normal, but but uh, the atoms that are emitting light, okay, or the material that's emitting light, let's suppose something emits light once a second in its frame of reference. In our frame of reference, that becomes, you know, once every thousand years, once every million years, once every billion years, the closer the object gets to the event horizon. So from our perspective, light is being emitted less and less frequently. Moreover, the light that is emitted is working its way out of this gravitational field. It's losing energy in the process. It, gets, it suffers what's called a gravitational redshift. It goes from being blue to red to infrared to radio. And in fact, the redshift becomes infinite at the event horizon in the sense that you know, light never escapes because it loses all of its energy. So, what was emitted as visible light shifts to the radio wavelengths, or even longer, okay? So, so you can't actually see the material in this membrane for these technical reasons, okay? But from our perspective, nothing has ever fallen into the black hole. From the black hole's perspective, and from the matter's perspective, it has. It just means that what you mean...